sí, para los que nunca han estado, muy bienvenidas y muy bienvenidos. Y este grupo se formó el año pasado eh, para lecturas de coloniales, sobre todo, bueno, de diferentes disciplinas. También discutimos eh, dere derechos humanos y pues cada vez es un grupo un poco diferente porque hay otra persona que nos visita y um, es muy interesante. Y las um, sesiones se graban y luego pues para los quienes no puedan participar porque están en China o no sé dónde, pues pueden verlos después en YouTube. Hi Ronald, hi Kelly. Hello Julie. Okay. Um, so I think we can um, start slowly and while I'm doing the introduction, people can keep joining us. And it, like I said, um, we can always switch back and forth between English and Spanish. If there's any problems, people can also join in other languages and we will always find a way to translate as long as you're all included in the discussion because it's really about the discussion and about reading together you know like taking time to read these texts and using the lockdown and the terrible weather in berlin <laughs> to um to yeah to focus on readings so of course everybody is in a very different situation, but but it's very nice that we're meeting in this context. So let me just start. Welcome everyone. Today I have the honor and pleasure of introducing Professor Estel Tarica, who's visiting us for session number 11 of our reading group on decolonialization, new colonialism and human rights. We are very excited to be working with you today, Estelle, also because the texts you shared with us for the session connect many points that we have touched upon in earlier readings, such as the convivencia with our surroundings, the value of work, the role of language and storytelling, the untranslatability of theoretical concepts, and so on. But let me first introduce you to the group. Estel Tarica is professor of Latin American literatures and cultures in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California, Berkeley, and a former chair of the Latin American Studies program at Berkeley. She did her PhD in comparative literature at Cornell and has served as the co-founder and co-director with Yvonne Del Valle of the Berkeley Research Group Mexico and the Rule of Law. Professor Tarika's research areas include the study of racial ideologies and discourses of cultural decolonization, especially in Mexico, the Andes, and the French Caribbean. Her work is particularly engaged with questions of novelistic form and language as a means to approach the dynamics of modern subjectivity in highly racialized societies. In 2008, Estel Tarica published The Inner Life of Mestizo Nationalism, a monograph dedicated to the discourse of indigenismo and mestizaje in Mexico, Peru, and Bolivia, with textual examples by Jose Maria Arredas, Rosario Castellanos, and Jesus Lara. Other authors Tarica has analyzed in essays and articles include Francisco Rojas Gonzalez, André Schwarzbart, Patrick Chamoiseau and Leo Spitzer. Her publications have appeared in edited volumes and in journals such as Chasqui, Revista de Crítica Literaria Latinoamericana, Latin American Literary Review, Journal of Latin American Studies, Politica Común, and Yale French Studies. Her current book manuscript examines the circulation and reception of Holocaust testimony in Latin America during the Cold War. A publication that most of us might already have worked with is her definition of indigenismo for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia, um, Latin American History from 2016. And she also writes about figuras afroperuanas, the connection between Jewish mysticism and the ethics of decolonization, the construction of cultural otherness, Creole conteur and the ethics of survival, bilingualism and poetics of migration, radical politics and or the rule of law in Mexico and victims and counter victims in contemporary Mexico. In short, all kinds of topics that are relevant to our field, um, of, to our fields of interest here in this group. And um, luckily we can all connect to these topics with 
perspectives from our different disciplines. And I think some of you already know each other. Um, so, well, we'll come to that in the discussion. Let me just say as well, we're delighted to have a specialist of decolonial Latin American literature among us. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to discuss these texts with you. Thanks again, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katarina. Thanks for that um, wonderful um, introduction. Um, it's always defamiliarizing to hear one's uh, work <laughs> through the voice of another. Um, and I, I really appreciate the invitation and thank you also Callie for, for making the link. Um, and Callie, I just didn't recognize you in your Zoom your Zoom box there, so hi. <laughs> um, and it's um, great to, to meet all of you um, and join in this group. I'm um, sort of envious that you've created this kind of community over the past year. It's such a great idea. Um, and that you've, I looked over all the people and texts that you've engaged with and it's just fabulous. So I'm, I'm really honored to be um, a part of this for today. Um, and I wanted to start with sort of some introductory comments, um, mostly kind of addressing the question of why these texts and why so many of them and kind of the links between them and the questions or the issues that I wanna explore with you all that are centered around the question of indigenous literatures, indigenous memory, and decolonizing the study of Latin American literature. Um, and I know that these were, even if these some of these texts were short, um, there's a lot of them. I don't know if you all got to all of them and I'm not offended if we don't touch on um, every one of them. And so I'll just, I'll just kind of give some introductory framing statements and then see where it goes from there with, with you all. Um, so um, th this, this work, well, these works are part of what has been um, more my teaching area than a re research area, although I have, started to do some writing on this. Um, and I've been inspired by recent scholarship by people like Arturo Arias, Gloria Chacon, um, and then some of the people that I, I um, circulated um, among you um, for today. Um, and one of the ways, one of the um, sort of key moments for me in, in, in what would be a kind of decolonizing approach to Latin American literature um, is something that comes from Gloria Chacon, which has to do with reading native yeah. literatures, indigenous literatures outside of national frameworks, outside of a national canon formation. Um, Chacon makes a point, and so, right, why didn't I give you Gloria Chacon's work? I could have, but I didn't. That was one too many things. But she talks about the kind of irony that um, uh, in, in Guatemala, indigenous peoples have to ask permission from the nation state to access their own historical patrimony. And she's thinking of like ruins that are protected and that now the people for whom these are incredibly meaningful um, cultural spots um, can't, don't have free access to them. They have to pass through that patrimo national patrimonial mediating structure. And so how could we read texts that, that may, we may think of as kind of key to uh, at least a modern canon, um, how can we read them outside of a kind of national patrimony framework? And what are the contexts of indigenous communities in particular that make these texts meaningful? So kind of changing how we frame the texts and thinking about what makes them meaningful in a different light. And in particular, what I'm interested in is thinking about self-determination. So indigenous self-determination is kind of the horizon, is kind of the frame here and how indigenous literatures help us think about indigenous self-determination. Self Native scholars have a lot to teach us in this regard. Um, I'm interested in what happens when we put um, Latin American scholars, Native and other other um, in dialogue with US, North American Native 
Native scholars like Daniel Heath Justice. I find, find his work very illuminating um, and um, a really great guide. Um, in dialogue with, with Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, who's obviously sort of one of the shining stars of indigenous thought um, and just has an incredible capacity to um, lay out the stakes in a really clear way. Um, and so thinking about Daniel Heath Justice and Silvia Rivera as helping us understand what the indigenous contexts for indigenous literature might be today. Um, and how these indigenous literatures, even someone like Juan Mampoma de Ayala, help imagine indigenous future for futurities, how they help us envision what an arc of indigenous self-determination can look like. Um, I put Arguedas in there because I think he might also be an indigenous author or indigenous scholar, but not, not really. This is a debate we could have um, about whether he, how he contributes to indigenous thought and to indigenous self-determination. That's a really open question that I would love to, to address with you all. Um, but what these scholars have done in terms of framing is create um, a set of contexts or a set of concerns that resonate more with, let's say, like local and planetary concerns and perhaps less with kind of Latin Americanist or nationalist concerns. Again, that's a kind of um, several kind of points of debate or nexus of debate that, that, that we could have. Um, what are the main concerns, um, the main contexts of self-determination, um, indigenous communities that make this literature meaningful? Um, the main concerns have to do with sustainability, with staving off extractivism, um, and with a very deep consciousness raising work about how we shift the terms of of what counts as important. And here I'm thinking of the work of Linda Tui Y. Smith, who's a Maori scholar, about who writes about transforming what counts as important to the powerful. And this is something that I think is really important work um, that um, maybe we might take for granted. Maybe we don't pay enough attention to the to how we do that um, as, as teachers and scholars. Um, getting kind of a little bit more specific, um, some of that transformative work, we can see it in how these texts imagine space and place, um, how they help us orient to where we are, um, how to live a good life where we are. Um, they are reparative works, they repair colonial fragmentation. Um, they turn to the past in order to lay a path for the future. So memory and history are imperative, um, but not in a nostalgic vein. Memory and history are transformative experiences. Um, and then a number of questions come up for us as, as teachers and scholars. What do we mean by literature when we bring all of these texts together? Um, we have to kind of grapple with our definitions there. Um, and Daniel Heath Justice, Arguedas, um, others kind of help us deal with that. Um, I notice that both Silvia Rivera and Arguedas talk about um, the universal appeal or the universal potential of indigenous literatures. And so I'm interested in that appeal to universalism and how that's different from other kinds of universalism that we've may have seen um, as, as part of imperialist or colonial projects. Um, is that kind of universalizing of a text like the Manuscrito de Huarochiri part of decoloni decolonizing the canon so that it can instruct and delight students who are really foreign to it? Um, and thinking as a teacher, what are the kind of secondary materials that we need to bring into dialogue with these texts. Um, I gave you that uh, article by Matt Mannheim and Sales Careño, which is you know, a very um, beautifully constructed, um, but jargon rich <laughs> um, 
uh, essay. Um, and it's a little bit jarring to have that kind of ethno-historical perspective alongside these other works. But you know, how necessary is that? What do we do with that? Those kind of di diverse sort of registers of, of language. Um, so I could, I could, you know, start going into each one of these texts, but maybe I'll stop there and see where you all want to go. Does that seem like a good, good plan? Sure, sure. This is a great overview. Maybe we can just check who read which text and if people read them at all. Um, did anyone have a chance to read um, one of them? Have you heard of them before? Have you? Yeah, Raul. Um, so I guess we can, um, we could also share the screen if it comes to, you know, um, certain paragraphs of close readings or whatever. I read them all, I have um, many things to say about all of them. I also thought it was really interesting to see um, how much these texts um, connect to other things we already talked about. Like, for example, um, I mean, not only Im like among each other, they communicate really well. For example, when um, Daniel Heath Justice speaks about uh, the idea of um, l'art pour l'art, the art for art's sakes, and then um, and then once and then changes that into the art for life's sake, um, and then he comes to this um, whole bias and of sexism and classism and and reading and how we are predetermined by like when we take a book and how he teaches that. I also thought that was like all very very interesting. Um, and interesting to see in, in comparison to the other to the other conversations we already had. And then he says this thing um, that not all not all knowledge is um, accessible for everyone. Um, and and then in Argueda's story, the short story, there's this sentence, there's this phrase where he says, "El mundo a veces guarda un silencio cuyo sentido solo alguien percibe." So I thought there's always like little connections like this. That I that I thought are um, disconcerting on the one hand because we're obviously academics and we want to know it all, but on the other hand, it's also protected knowledge and maybe it should not be colonized this way in 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 this context. So there are so many things to speak about. This is just yeah one first impression that I think was really interesting to see because it's like on both um, on both levels like what do we talk about and how do we talk about it, right? And who talks about which topics and yeah, who gets, who gets to talk in which space? What is the role of storytelling in, in all of this, et cetera. There's, yeah, there's so many things, <laughs> there's so many things. Um, I'm welcoming everybody to the discussion, whatever you think was interesting for you to hear or yeah, what you were most, you can decide with us where the discussion, where you want the discussion to go. I, I thought it was, hi, I'm Marta, this is my first time here. Um, so I thought, I thought it was really interesting um, when, when um, I think Keith talked about the fact that like um, a lot of indigenous traditions didn't survive the litters, like, the, you know the, when when like literacy was introduced somehow and then like also like I think in in Bruce Manaheim like he he talks a little bit about like um well he's talking about that word waka and then he talks um he talks about like how like all of a sudden it got subsumed into certain conceptions of it because um because of the like um like religions that you know the western religions that were trying to like um uh, I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but the Western religions were trying to like subsume it into certain things in order to explain their their ways of knowing and being and to explain like it, like you know Western religions to them. But it, it so it kind of like it, in, I guess in both ways it kind of limited the indigenous knowledge and tradition. And so I was interested in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great point because um, I think one one of the um, 
let's call it like a commonplace narrative is that um, the imposition of Western literacy um, kind of meets indigenous orality and sort of destroys it or changes it or, or, or ends up, what really ends up happening is it kind of reifies it as a kind of um, singular opposition to, to writing. Um, and what Heath Justice and, and, uh, and other scholars have been showing is that in fact, indigenous peoples have taken up alphabetic literacy in their own ways um, that are not about assimilation, but actually about preserving, um, preserving their cultures. So maybe, maybe we could share screen for a minute. Or I, and I don't know if I have the privilege to do that or Katarina, you could do it. But um, for those of you who read the Manuscrito de Huarochiri, or if you didn't read it, um, the, the little prologue um, kind of dram dramatizes that um, indigenous um, inst instrumentalizing of writing. Um, sh should we look at that, Katarina? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm doing it right now. One second. Okay. Can you see it already? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does every does everybody here speak? Yes. Oh, um, yes. Could everybody um, turn off their microphones while they're not talking and just turn them on while they're talking? That would be amazing. And um, please don't feel disencouraged to participate in the discussion. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much better. Okay, here you go. I think now you can see both, right? You can see yeah. both languages. Okay. Does everybody read um, read either Quechua or Spanish or, or does someone need a translation into English? Um, I guess most people speak, understand Spanish. If, if not, you can tell us, yes, I know they at least understand. <laughs> well, so right. So this, this little prologue, um, is just a fascinating instantiation of what, um, was it, was it my, Marta was just saying, um, if the Indians of antiquity of old times had known writing, their lives in everywhere would not have um, been lost. We would know about them um, the way we know about the Spaniards, um, their images would appear. Um, and so this is to me a moment where instead of seeing writing kind of devastate indigenous forms of expression, we see indigenous peoples taking it up for their own purpose, purposes, um, their own purposes of posterity, of memorializing, um, of self-knowledge. I think it's, um, again, uh, Heath who speaks about um, the literatures in Australia, right, where he says um, that some have really created new languages and new literary literacies um, through writing and that has also changed the canon. So, and also, and I think actually Silvia Rivera also says that, that it's not, um it's it's not always a loss there's been so much cre creativity um about texts that have been written in quechua after spanish colonization that in, were enriched with spanish vocabulary or not enriched but like found creative ways to um to deal with both languages at the same time and all and like different concepts at the same time. And I actually thought in the Wadotiri manuscript, it's so impressive how many parallels there are also to Christian, um, to Christianity. Like there's this 
whole idea of um, the a, a virgin who gives birth, and then um, and then um, this, and then chapter three, I think, is the chapter where it sounds um, very similar to Noah's Ark, and so on. So there's, and then also um, the Viracocha who appears as a poor man disguised as a poor man and then isn't recognized by the people so so i was asking myself how much is this you know like where is, there's so much tension or is it tension or is it creativity or what is happening because is it you know it could it could also be read as a tension between um trying to preserve all this culture but also at the same time trying to pass the censorship um that was um, imposed by the colonial um rule and that they had to you know they already had they wanted to preserve this and they're and they're writing it down but at the same time they know they already have to change it a little bit so it would pass censorship well in this particular context the the story about how this text came into being is is actually um pretty fascinating which is that the um, um, an, an extirpator of idolatries, um, Francisco de Avila, um, who was the sort of like the parish priest of Huarochiri, which is a, a, a place um, just um, a little bit south of Lima. Um, he, uh, he, well, the, the story is complicated because it seems as if he was a like kind of a bad priest who um, uh, abused and um, extorted his uh, parishioners and possibly um, to get revenge from them or to distract away from the lawsuit that they had um, filed against him with uh, ecclesiastical authorities, he um, took up this project of recording where all of the holy sites for the local people were. And so the text was written sort of um, at his request in a way. Um, and, but for nefarious purposes, which I don't think he was honest about when he, um, when he requested it, which is um, for, through the stories to find out where all of the the quote unquote sacred sites were. And so it's it's a very kind of bittersweet um, frame for this um, because it's as if the, the writers were kind of handing him the, the keys to their own destruction, um, the destruction of, of the, the people who are, whose stories are being told in, um, in this book. Um, so it's, it's not exactly the context of censorship, Katarina, as you are putting it, but definitely the, the circumstances of textual production are quite relevant. Um, I, I myself have not been, um, let's say, anxious about whether this is a text that um, is um, grappling with uh, a Christ, Christ, Christian myth or Christian ideas. Um, and not that I'm not interested in that, but I'm not, I'm sort of not worried about it. Um, so I don't know how, how others of you think about this. I mean, to me, it seems as if once we focus on what this indigenous author is saying, then that's, that's where we, you know, this is what this author thinks is important <laughs> in a way. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. No, this is great. And it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and obviously um, it just um, shows where my reading comes from and that I have, like I, I was trained to always see um, you know, Christian symbol symbolicism or whatever in whatever I'm reading. So this has definitely happened. But then also I was surprised that they that you would say um, Jesus Cristo. I don't know where it was. It was like, okay, what is happening? 
but yeah it's maybe it's not it's probably not important you're right well it's, it's, it's not that it's not important it would be more like why is it important or what do we do what do we do with that yeah i, I mean it's it is important because it's part of the text but why <laughs> i thought i saw somebody's hand um raul Yes, I, I was thinking how to, to connect a bit this text with a couple of other texts that have that are not written by uh, originally by um, indigenous people, but also reflect the um, indigenous thinking. Uh, for example, the Relación de los Agustinos en Huamachuco, which some people call like the first uh, anthropological treaty. No, and also the Manual de Extirpación de Idolatrias from Juan Perez Bocanegra, which is also written in a bilingual manner because it was thought to be used for evangelization and which tries to draw some parallels between the native religiousness and the Christian um, Catholic religiousness. So in Perez Bocanera, there is a lot of trying to equate the sun to, to God in some ways, which we also see then in the Corpus Christi, in the representation of the Corpus Christi, or also in the, in the paintings of the Escuela Cusqueña. So uh, I, I, at this time of the colonization period, I think the, the Mm, the purpose was to so of, of some of the orders was to approach to seek to to mm, close the gap between the two modes of religiousness because there was this idea that one of the apostles have uh, made its way into America I don't remember which one of them so some of the the some of the orders believe that the religious orders believe that it was this long lost Christians. So they were trying to find some um, equations or analogies and that all ended at, at the end of the, um, in the last quarter of the 16th century, you now with the Toledan reforms. So perhaps it would be useful also to read this, this text in, in tandem, I don't know. What do you think? Right, so I think it's um, absolutely, it would be fascinating to read, um, to put the Manuscrito de Huarochiri in conversation with, with contemporaneous texts. Um, it, it is in conversation with um, Arriaga's um, um, idolatry extirpating um, work. Um, and the, the question of, um, pastoral Quechua of the um, the linguistic registers of Quechua that are starting to be alphabetized in this period. I mean, it's definitely a kind of a moment of intense literary creation, right? I mean, things are being said, alpha, written or alpha, alphabetized that have never been alphabetized before. Um, so I th I think that yeah, that's a great a great way to approach this text. Um, I think, um, again, the question of, let's say, um, are you, uh, to, me, to me, this has to do with the framing, right? Which is, how do you bring those texts in, in a way that helps us understand this, this um, kind of indigenous self-determination impulse that I'm seeing run through all of these works. Um, because I think we can, it's in a way easier for us to see the, um, the, the, the genocidal violence that's happening, right? And so of course you, you, know, you can't minimize that. It's, it's all over, it's all over the place. And when you read um, Avila's Tratado, which kind of, which is a kind of paired text with the Manuscrito de Huarochiri. I mean, it's just devastating. It's devastating the level of objectifying, the level of contempt he has for the people who he has been tasked with caring for 
um, the kind of language she uses to describe them and the things that they care about, which make it so easy to destroy those things. I mean, it's, it's um, terrifying in a way. Um, so that it's hard. I think it's hard to bring these texts together in a way because then you, you kind of get lost in, in the genocide. Um, uh, but then you see someone like Silvia Rivera who goes back to those moments of violence and sees in them a way to um, kind of nurture indigenous self-determination in the present. Um, Should I share uh, Silvia Rivera? Should I share a specific part of the text or something? Maybe what or what is a good example for um, the what you were talking about the self determination? I was thinking, um, I mean, in Argueda's short story, obviously, it's very interesting to see um, how the dancer is at the same time also the mountain and the condor and, and everything at the same time. So maybe that is an interesting starting point, but then Arguedas, and then later we can question Arguedas as, right. as a writer. Well, so Katarina, maybe what we could do, um, so I, I, the, there's, there's a scene from, the, from chapter two of Waruchiri that um, is a kind of intertextual moment for um, Arguedas' story. So could we actually look again at Waruchiri for a minute and then go to Arguedas' story? And then I do, I do have places we could go to in Silvia Rivera. Um, so in, um, yeah, so here we are in chapter two. If you could go down, what I'm looking for is when um, Kuniraya Viracocha instructs the animals, he's looking for um, the mother of his child and some animals help him and some um, don't. And the ones that help him receive um, receive sort of gifts and talents. And so um, you can see you're, you're right there. Um, it's the paragraph that starts, después encontró con un halcón. El halcón le dijo, ella va muy cerca, has de encontrarla. Y Kuniraya le contestó, tú has de ser muy feliz, almorzarás picaflores, y luego comerás pájaros de todas clases. Y si mueres o alguien te mata, con una llama te ofrendarán los hombres. Y cuando canten y bailen, te pondrán sobre su cabeza y allí hermosamente estarás. And this is exactly the image that we get from Rasuniti, which is hermosamente estarás. Wamani es wamani. Just that kind of presence, that persistence of estar <laughs> um, and how Kuniraya here is setting up a relationship between the dancer and the halcón. Um, so um, should we, does anyone else want to say anything about this before we stop sharing this screen? Um, should we look Maybe. at the, oh, go yeah. ahead, Katarina, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. The only thing is that I don't have it as a PDF right now. Oh, but no, I do, I do. Shall I, shall I share? Can you? Yeah. Sorry, here we go. Okay, this is <laughs> this is an old copy, <laughs> uh, so you can see my hand as well as the text. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit there. That's that's better, right? Um, so I guess what I'm going to do. Sorry for all the scrolling here. Um, I, I, I want to focus first of all on this last, this last phrase here, wamani es wamani, which is you know a kind of deep ontological statement. 
Um, but it does seem to me to echo the hermosamente estarás, right? This is the Wamani um, persisting um, and persisting as itself, as himself. Um, and the, the themes of the story in a way that, that um, Arguedas um, kind of signals to us, but keeps in the background, back, background the, the themes of colonial um, violation, right? So we have these references to the horse, the patrones horse who has splashed, um, uh, stained the, the eldest daughter, um, a reference to sexual violation, the reference to a God who is growing in the earth and who will come out and get vengeance against the horse. And the horse is such a fundamental um, image here because it refers us to um, Santiago Mataindio, Santiago Matamoros, who is always on a big horse with a sword um, and the, the uh, the patas, the, the legs of the horse are always about to come down um, on, on the enemy. Um, we can see that, let's see if I can find. Um, well, first of all, here we see the, the transfer from one generation to another and the young dancer Atok um, Saiku um, now has the Wamani on his head, right? El Wamani aquí. En mi cabeza, en mi pecho, aletando, dijo el nuevo danzac. And this is the, so this is the rebirth. Um, su, su corriente de siglos, aleteando. So again, just this idea of continuity um, and of being able to um, resist that colonial violence. I'm trying to find this, the, the, the reference to the, the God who is growing. Um, here we go. El Dios está creciendo, matará al caballo. These are some of the last words that Rasuniti um, speaks. This, is there any place in the story that, that you all would like me to go to? Um, I don't want to be the only one talking, but also um, I was interested in the role of the women in this story as well, because the mother explains it all to the daughters and, and then the, the um, um, La Muchacha Mayor, she doesn't see, she, first she doesn't see the Wamani in her, in her, in the, in the dancer mm -hmm. fa slash father, mm -hmm. um, but, and then all of a sudden the younger one sings a song and becomes part of the ritual somehow. And in the end, she's the one who says the most decisive words. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting because she's also the youngest person in the room. She's like really um, maybe impersonating the new, the new generation or the continuity. Um, yeah. Right. Right, so I think the the manuscrito de Waruchiri and the, and chapter two, it's it's a really interesting intertext there because um, these are about the gifts the gifts of life, right? The there's a fertility. It's, it's about death, but it's also about fertility. Um, there's a kind of love interest happening. It seems as if the harp the harpist and the youngest daughter are looking at each other with love um, uh, or the, sorry, the harpist is noticing that the youngest daughter and the new dancer maybe could, um, you know, get together. So um, the, the importance of the corn here, um, the kind of fruit of the, of the soil. So, um, and, and the, I, I think it's, it is interesting, kind of an open question, the role of, of women in this story, but also in the Manuscrito de Guarochiri, um, sort of who are they as, as um, characters? Yeah. 
And I should say, I guess I didn't mention that um, Arguedas was translating the manuscrito into Spanish around the time that he was putting this story together. Um, so these are texts that come from the early 60s. Um, so I think they, 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 you know, one, one is mirrored in the other for, for Arguedas. Um, and just thinking about that statement by Linda Tui Y. Smith, you know, what counts as important, transforming what counts as important, there's something about this story that calls attention to things that seem unimportant or that might seem completely um, irrelevant and gives them a certain kind of importance. The, the passage of ants along a windowsill, um, the Kui who comes out of his hole for a second and squeaks and then comes back in. Um, the very light sound of the, the scissors. Um, so that importance is not measured just in terms of size or loudness. Um, there's a whole range of senses, sensory moments that um, sort of come alive over, this, over the story. I'm gonna, shall I stop, uh, Raul? One, one thing that gets my attention and for uh, about this, this story is that as I was growing up, there was always the, this, this belief that the, the dancer had made a, a deal with the devil so he could dance so good as, as they do, no? And, and this whole thing now, now checking the the the, the 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 short story again, it's sort of like a re like a vindication of the more on a more rural, more native uh, way of connecting to divinities. Not just the role of the the wamani, but also this whole um, putting on the front of the stage the the relationships between the dancer and the gods, which is, as, as, I, as, I, as I was telling at the beginning, it is either demonized by the dominant culture or not present at all for the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that I, I, I just, it just came to, to my head remembering this, that thing, but I haven't seen that uh, mm, topicalized, thematized uh, before. I'm not sure if you know about uh, some paper or some analysis that connects this, these dots. The, the idea of a pact with the devil? More the idea that this goes against this type of idea, this way of presenting yeah. the, the, the whole, the whole um, Dance ritual goes against this idea com that comes from from Christianity. Right, right, right. No, I think that's I think that's right. Um, I, there's been a lot of great scholarship on this story. Um, a really amazing piece by Sara Castro Clarín from the late '80s that links this story to um, the um, so-called sickness dance of, um, of the 16th century, the Taki Onkoi, and um, what happened to um, indigenous localities after the sort of um, like political head, the Inca head of um, the political structure was removed by, by the Spanish and replaced. Um, in a way, it sort of liberated a lot of local ideas to come back to the fore before they were then also sort of attempted to be destroyed by, by the Spanish. And so um, the, the, li the liberation of these forces is in a way the return of local, local wakas who had been subordinated to the Incas. And this is a, a, a later chapter in the Manuscrito de, de Huarochiri, which, um, you know, I. I ask that you read too, but 
keep keep going because it's really interesting. Um, and so these these wakas kind of come back to life, and and the um, so-called dancing sickness takionkoi is um, uh, um, a, a kind of manifestation of this. Um, let's say sense that the there might be a new opening here. There might be a new opening. Um, and that the, the wakas will come out now that the, the sun has kind of gone behind a cloud, which is which is also one of these refrains from from Quechua poetry, elegiacal Quechua poetry of the time. Maybe um, now that we've mentioned the wakas, um, that which obviously is another connection to no, don't stop sharing. Oh, it's okay. Want me to go back? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I was just saying this. The the text that to me sounded mostly linguistic, and I thought it was. It, I thought it was super interesting, even though obviously um, you have to like get used to the vocabulary. But um, the I think what made me what helped me understand this was actually one this one um, part passage in the story where uh, they describe Rasuniti and his. In the Wamani. So maybe we can just read this quickly for those who haven't had a chance to read the text. It's it's the sentence that says, um, Rasuniti era hijo de un Wamani grande, but I don't really know where it would be. Yeah. Um, right. It's So the here it is, yeah, yeah, exact, exactly. Rasuniti era hijo de un wamani grande de una montaña con nieve eterna. Él a esa hora le había enviado ya su espíritu, un cóndor gris cuya espalda blanca estaba vibrando. So, so I thought it was interesting because at first it was like, okay, what what is happening? Is this a montaña? Is is it a mountain? Is it a bird? Is it the spiritu is it um you know is it is it the devil or god now that raul was saying this there's this interesting it's not it's it's impossible to categorize this in christian categories so this is so i thought this was a great example to see this and then my question about this was also about arguedas like how in how far was he part of rituals like these because yeah how maybe you could just say something about this as well and where you draw the line of him being indigenous or not right so so Arguedas is is not indigenous uh, uh, in any in any way that um is legible according to our our, our identity categories but um there's something about this story and its connection to the Manuscrito de Huarochiri, which, which really brings, brings it forward, um, brings um, the, the, the themes of, of Huarochiri forward and, um, and um, shows, shows how, how so many of those themes are embedded in um, the, the the, the ways that people live still in the 20th century. Um, so, right, so this, this is where we get into these, these debates about authenticity and identity and who gets to claim um, what. And so I don't wanna claim that Arguedas is, in, is indigenous or an indigenous author, but, um, He's not, um, but there is something about his work that makes it that you you can read it. Um, uh, so people have tried to read it uh, and and as as a key piece of a kind of national canon or even a Latin Americanist canon. His later work, like. El Zorro de Arriba y El Zorro de Abajo really is engaging with a kind of decolonizing moment of the late 60s and the future of Peru. Um, 
but it also seems to me that you can read his work and this story in particular for self-determination, for a kind of indigenous sovereignty. Um, and that is quite rare, I think, for a non-indigenous author to be able to do. So that's why I would want him to be in this configuration. Um, still with a question mark, like still let's put, we can push against it. Um, but I think you can, you can um, see here um, um, just a real centering on indigenous perspectives and on indigenous sensibilities. Um, this, this story is telling us um, what counts as important um, in a way that that's, seems to me to be quite indigenous. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we can stop sharing now and so we can go back to discussion mode for everyone. Um, I um, I loved reading uh, the story and I think, I mean, to me personally, it was interesting because um, my the, the my family from the paternal side is um, from Peru and they grew up also with indigenous nannies, et cetera. So, and also learned some Quechua vocabulary, et cetera, but also were white like Arguedas. So, um, <laughs> so this is like, yeah, my my father was like, oh, yeah, of course, he's like so important. He teaches me my culture, etc. So, it's it's um so to me this is also interesting from that perspective. How yeah, who claims what and how and how far it's also, you know, you could either say it euphemistically and be like, Arias has um brought this in a time where it was not yet, um, you know easy to bring indigenous literature into the academy, et cetera, and into schools, Arguedas has pushed this forward, of course. So, so I guess there's obviously um, a big, there's a big importance in that as well. Well, I, I think of it as, um, let, let's ask like a very practical question. And I know not, not everybody here maybe is, is in literature. Um, but you, you're designing a course, you're teaching students. Um, what are the texts that you're going to, you know, put forward for a course that, that where you want students to read Indigenous literature in, in Peru? And um, I, um, I, have, I have worked so much <laughs> in my own career on the question of representation. Right, so and especially indigenista representation. Um, what happens if you leave all the indigenistas out, and but you you keep Arguedas, but you don't read him like an indigenista anymore? Um, suddenly, a whole bunch of things open up that hadn't opened up before. <laughs> or what if you read the indigenistas, but not as indigenistas as something else? Um, so, I, yeah, I think it. I think there's still so much we can do, even with the text that we think we know um, <laughs> inside and out, if we just change a little bit the framing and the dialogue. Um, who, who, what, what texts, what are the, which other texts are these texts in conversation with? And the conversation really does change. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that we jettison completely what are still important questions about representation because the, 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 the problem of cultural appropriation is still um, there. Um, the problem of um, a tourist industry that will glorify the Dansak, um, but that works in tandem with a state that promotes um, you know, terrible mining practices. Um, so that is something that has to be part of the conversation as well. Um, but I, I think in a way it has to do with how you read, how you read these and how you teach your students to read them.
Yeah, this is also what I was trying to say with um, Daniel Heath, right? Because he really questions and makes explicit how we read, how we want our students to read, how we actively decolonize our institution. So, and he brings um, this example of, um, so what this, one of the assignments for the students is they have to read a romantic novel, I think, in, the, in public. And obviously they cringe because it's so embarrassing for them um, to like open up this, this uh, yeah, like a romantic cheap novel in, in the train or whatever. And then, and then this is his example to question um, the whole classes and sexist bias that we bring to reading in the first place. So why do we read? How do we read? Who reads, et cetera? And then who do we read? What is acceptable and what is not? And what are the biases? What is considered important? And um, where will we go if we, because lots of, I mean, I always uh, have to start by telling my students to read non-male, non-white authors in the first place. <laughs> That, that idea about uh, that that um, Stella mentioned about reading Arguedas not as an indigenous still ringing in my head. I think it's it's really interesting. I from from the the little I know from the indigenous literature, um, Arguedas was always the this this figure like more um, in between two worlds. At least that's what uh, the the canon in Peru treats. You know, the the this 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 guy that being white and um, son of a landlord, but was kind of shunned away from the from the father and lives with the with the help basically. And there he finds a world for himself, where he still doesn't fit properly. There is another uh, really beautiful um, short story, Warmakuyai. Is something translates something like uh, uh, children's love, something like that, in which this this tension is is re really felt. So perhaps uh, that would be also an a way of what you propose. It's a, it's a really interesting way. I think it we can see much more layers to to this reading him as uh, not just not reading him as an indigenous, but as an author in the middle. Because I think at least in Peru and in the academia in Peru, it is not. This is an indigenous writer, and we need to approach him like that. And that also puts you some parameters and doesn't let you um, see other things that might lay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, Raul, the, the question of Arguedas in the middle is one that so, so one of the, the, the word that we haven't said yet today, which maybe we need to say is mestizo, right? So um, we, we're not using, I kind of purposely in a way have avoided using it um, because it's a word that is so overdetermined in terms of those national or Latin Americanist projects, right? Um, and um, so if, if we can think of him as in the middle, but not necessarily bring in mestizo as the subject. <laughs> Let's not make this about mestizo subjectivity. Um, right, and I mean, I, I have a lot of positive, to think, positive things to say about indigenismo and indigenista, indigenista perspectives. I mean, um, you know, and Arguedas was an indigenista in so many ways, and he was a director of an indigenista museum. Um, you know, there's there's no doubt that he was connected to um, indigenista state institutions um, on some some level. Um, but it has to do with, let's say. Um, 
what is it that he wants us to do with with the indigenous literatures that he's bringing forward? And um, I don't think he necessarily is thinking about creating that unified, modern identity, national identity. Um, it's it, there is really an attempt here to um, resensitize us to a vision or an experience that has been totally denied. So um, I've, uh, Julie? Um, I have a question, but it's totally different. And rather broad. Um, you spoke of divergent forms of universalism, and I want to know if you could um, speak a bit more, like um, give more concrete examples. I said we can't hear you right now. Thank you. Let me see if I can find that in the Silvia Rivera. I'm going to, to share screen and, and get her text up. Um, it's right here. She says, la alteridad indígena puede verse como una nueva universalidad que se opone al caos y a la destrucción colonial del mundo y de la vida. And, and, and what's interesting is that she, she is um, seeing the figure of the astrologer poet and the weavers as the, the ones who, as she says it, reveal that alternative weaving, that alternative um, almost like uh, plot of history. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting because this is that that idea of nueva universalidad, meaning basically that um, the knowledge that is contained in Waman Poma's text or in those practices of weaving and reading the stars um, could actually be relevant way beyond the indigenous community, indigenous communities that are that are taking these up right now. Um, this is that that sort of planetary moment. Um, I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Julie, did you want to say more about this, or is there some other place that you wanted us to go also that would look at that? Um, no, not especially. I found it very fascinating because it's very hard for me to imagine how exactly to oppose um, the colonial universality and this indigenous universality and it brings us back to this whole thought of how can we even try to understand it with concepts of western christian heritage um so i don't know i still can't really understand how to oppose or combine them um i don't know if you can try to explain more <laughs> um Right, I guess, I mean, I, I wanna thank you, I wanna thank all of you for being patient with me as I try and express these things to you. And so you, you all are helping me think, think through some of these. This is very much, um, you know, me, me in, in progress and in process. Um, so um, when I think about indigenous self-determination, I think of that as a project that involves some elements of what we could, might think of as identity politics, but it's not the same as identity politics, right? And so there's a kind of um, thinking 
where you, you, you look at a text like the Manuscrito de Huarochiri or Arguedas's text and you say, well, is this really indigenous or is it sort of mestizo or is it also Christian? And you kind of put in these boxes and you try and figure out um, how to slot the text into these boxes. And then when it kind of explodes the boxes, um, our mind sort of explodes as well. Um, and so I think in a way, I'm, I'm looking at like a farther, I'm trying to look at a farther horizon. Um, and that's where, um, you know, maybe this kind of gets us back to um, eco-criticism just doesn't seem like the right word, the, a good enough word for what I'm talking about, but let's call it um, an eco-awareness. Um, or let's just go um, go back to even like more general moral principles about what what is a good life on the planet or what is a sustainably good life, and um, I do think that what uh, Silvia Rivera is is saying is that you can go back to Wamampoma, who was himself an extirpator of idolatries. She does not mention this, but he worked for an extirpator of idolatries. He was deeply Christian. Right, um, and yet in his text he brings forth a kind of knowledge that is still relevant today. Um, so, um, what would happen if um, we took those images, uh, the images of the weavers um, or the images of the farmers, as images that resonated for us, who are not weavers and not farmers and not indigenous and not Indian? Um, and um, what if they became our guiding images? So is there a way that we could do that without overly reifying and fetishizing them? Is there a way that we could do that without appropriating it and doing it as a way to gain some kind of power for ourselves? That, you know, I don't know, but I think that is the proposal in a sense. Um, Maybe we could look at, um, I'll go to a, a slightly earlier moment in her text. Um, it, it has to do with her style of reading. She's just not worried about that question of authenticity. Um, so let me see. Um, If I can find this. Um, here we go. So she says here. She's saying, even though um, Wamampoma has adopted the Gregorian calendar, he is still showing through, through that frame a, a way of being that has nothing to do with the Gregorian calendar, right? Which has to do with the agricultural cycles of Andean, Andean people. Um, here again, like luego de haber detallado los daños de la conquista, where we see all the abuses, we see the usurpations, all of the the what what really we are looking at genocide as it's happening right um the calendar comes back and what is the calendar the calendar is that marking of time that repetitive marking of time it's just a very striking striking juxtaposition right there um i see i see a hand so i'll stop there oh sorry to i'm very much on uh, asking about what you're talking about I'm wondering if in Rivera, and I, I just getting this sense, I read the text before and then reading it again with you, I feel like I'm seeing it in a different way. I, I wonder if there's a, a critique of colonialism as too small and not universal enough, uh, contrasted with an indigenous perspective that is, that is positive as a, as a sort of broader, more universal, because it seems like colonialism tells a story of being this totalitarian reordering of everything that includes everything. And in her vision, colonialism ignores almost everything. <laughs> it's, it tends to fragment and to create chaos rather than order. Like it's, it's the opposite of what it thinks itself to be. 
maybe. I think that's right. I think um, the, the, the lesson she takes from Wamampoma, and she's not the only one who takes this lesson, but she says it in a particular way, is that he is showing us a world that is headed for total destruction. It cannot sustain itself. And, and we, we are living the, that reality now. So I think that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It is not a self, colonialism is not saving anyone. It's, it's destroying us. So, so that um, universalist approach may be um, a way in which we, we who are not indigenous also buy in and say like, wow, <laughs> you know, we, we are not being saved. Those of us who have been the most direct beneficiaries of colonialism are not being saved by it either. Um, I see another hand. Yes, thank you, Estelle. In the, in the text, actually, my, my question was, uh, I think about a little bit the same as you were saying. Uh, later in the text, Sylvia is very harsh with uh, Western North American academia. Uh, right. and, and, uh, she, and, and so I'm not asking you what is your position, but she, she really uh, uh, put that she really, so, I mean, I didn't notice this, but she, she really, I noticed in some aspect, but she really showed that within uh, the, the, the post-colonial, decolonial literature, there, there, there is, I think she said willingly, but I, I don't think so, but I don't know, that there is a kind of cooptation and strategy of, 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 uh, of um, concealing some, some, some local struggles, you know, and and so it's a bit hard to to find a, a balance here because without I don't know how 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 would you how would you how the academia how the university how the academic research can find balance. I mean, you already I mean I think you already respond to that before a little bit, but later in page 65 around here, she's very hard here. So it was just my right observation. Well I think that's that's a great that's a great point. Um, um I think I think that's a real challenge for us who are who are North American academics or located in North America, or maybe also in in Berlin and in other places um, like that, where um, all of this can become cultural capital for our own careers and our own positions. Um, and so, um, uh, you know what? What do we do? <laughs> we we want to keep studying. We want to keep learning. We want to keep teaching. So how is it that we do that in a way that does not turn into a kind of covert power grab for ourselves? And um, for me, it has to do with um, first of all, I, I've been doing so much more of this work in the classroom than than in publication. Um, and the classroom is this kind of ephemeral space, right? Where um, we have a conversation and it's not clear, we don't always remember whose voices we're speaking. And um, it has contributed to our sense of who we are and our sense of community, but it has not, there's no author, right? Um, so, so for me, that has been one, one way to grapple with that is to think of this as uh, pet pedagogical um, and to think of myself as a teacher and, and not as an author. Um, but, but of course I also am an author and you know, I have a CV and there will be lines on my CV and I, there's, there's a, a line from Michel de Certeau, I think, who is criticizing Lévi-Strauss who you know, leaves 
Brazil and the genocide of the, the Nambiquara, which is happening as he's writing and he gets back to Paris and he puts on the laurels of the French Academy. You know, it's all very easy. Um, and, and that's a reality that, right, we need to always bring it back into the conversation. You can't pretend that is not the reality, but I don't think um, it has to be the only conversation the only thread of the conversation. Um, so, and, and, and another practice in a way that I would say that, um, that is sort of useful is just citational. <laughs> Citing, you know, always bringing forward the words, um, um, always making it clear when you are paraphrasing somebody else's words. Um, always sort of honoring <laughs> the sources of your own thinking. Yeah, I see. I see another another hand. I think it's mine, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Hi. No. So I just wanted to say, like, like, thank you for this conversation because, like, like, just just going through it, like, in all, like, the, the spaces where we pause, like, makes me realize that this is not really something that, like, a topic that we're used to talking about, and, and, and so we're trying to make, like, the language for it somehow, and so, like, I was thinking of, like, I'm in education, and I was thinking of, like, the term brokering, in which, like, um, it, it's used sometimes when, like, uh, let's say, um, like, kids whose parents only speak like an immigrant language have to go help help the parents in the doctor to translate. But there's also the term like cultural brokering and that's used more like in education in terms of like, um, you know, somebody like maybe, maybe, maybe a teacher that's from like the culture of the students is trying to explain to the students like how like academia is different and like showing the differences or maybe somebody from the group is trying to explain like a, a teacher that's not from the group like what what the culture is like and so like I was you know like particularly like Bruce Mannerheim's piece and I, I, I think he's white right he's a white person right and so um like I like just looking at like all the time that he took to to talk about that word waka it, in a certain way i felt like it, it was in some way some kind of like cultural brokering like trying to explain it to people that don't understand where this is coming from and trying to expand their conception of it and in terms of like how how he feels like you know um, you know, per Peruvian, Peruvian indigenous people use that word in, in a lot of ways and everything. And so like, it, it brought me back to, I guess, your question in a certain way in terms of like, either looking at this in an indigenista framework or not an ind indigenista framework in a certain way. And it's like, so I was just thinking in terms of like, like the extent like whether we do an indigenista framework or not, the extent of cultural brokering we have to do and whether eventually like it's enough or not, or or to what extent it's, you know, to what extent we're gonna be able to understand things in one way or another. I, and I can't explain it any better because it's just like, I'm just trying to like go like figure this out now, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that that idea of brokering. Um, you know the the term. I I wonder if that's how how similar or how different that is from the idea of mediation, the mediate the mediator, right. um, which is a term from sort of Latin American literary criticism. Um, the, the mediator is always an object of suspicion also because you know what <laughs> what gain are they getting what are they skimming off the top of the negotiation uh, for themselves um, yeah th those are interesting questions I mean just about this text real quickly um because it's not only the it's I mean it's two authors right it's Mannheim and Guillermo Salas and I think Guillermo Salas Carreño is not um, white, 
But anyways, I thought that that was interesting to see that they're doing it together and they're sharing the authorship and the authorship itself is something super Western somehow, mm -hmm. um, or Northwestern. Whereas what you said, Estelle, that Silvia um, Rivera is, is more like, she's like not, she's, uh, I don't know how you, I don't remember, wait, you said she wasn't preoccupied with, um, like what was it that you said I'd, but you said she didn't she like she's she's just you know she like positions herself and um she criticizes Quijano she criticizes Mignolo she's like um, Mama Puma was basically like uh, Franz Fanon she's very much um <laughs> juggling around with all these people and it's great like it's it's so good to read all this um but it's it's a little less devotional somehow so and also um so i was questioning myself i'm, I'm not sure if this is um, i don't know <laughs> blasphemic or whatever but uh, i was questioning um myself also with all these manuscripts the what a td manuscript etc it's it comes we don't know the name of the author um is it a collective it, you know it comes from an oral tradition so it's a collective um writing it's a collective manuscript in the end there's you know there's very different concepts about where knowledge comes from and how we attribute it to to certain people or not or to certain places or to you know to how how is knowledge in the world per se so um so i thought that was another interesting question um maybe to think about where where this whole brokerage and mediation and and everything comes in um, and and which brings us back to teaching. And I think Callie had a question about um, something related to this. Sorry, <laughs> it's just a derailing of thoughts. Callie. Um, yeah, one second. I was just trying trying to capture one last thought um, in my notes. Um, yeah, it's kind of a good question though uh, for such little time that we have left, I think. Um, so I don't know if you, if you can give just a, a quick answer. Maybe you have some examples off the top of your head, or you know, maybe it's something that you two are still thinking about. Uh, but I was wondering when you're talking about being a teacher versus being an author, and kind of since we're talking about decentering ourselves anyway, in terms of something that's more related to I don't know relativism or perspectivism in a cosmological or ontological sense, um, I thought we could talk about that pedagogically as well. How do we decenter ourselves? Um, but we've been talking about that quite a bit already. So I wanted to touch on something you said in your introduction about um, turning to the past not as something nostalgic, but as something transformative. So thinking about these narratives uh, as a means to affect change in the future. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about um, Bolivia and extractivism and more contemporary concerns. So as somebody who feels a bit out of my depth talking about um, some of these texts, I, I know a bit more about um, indigenous texts from Brazil, for example. But a question that's on my mind as I'm teaching, because I'm also interested in these connections between past and present is and future, is how or if you talk about these texts in relation to things that are going on in the world today, um, mm -hmm. or if this is something that students bring up. This is something I've been trying to do in a class that I taught last quarter. So just bringing in, um, like contemporary indigenous thought and issues in, in, in relation to these texts. Right, so one, um, so um, in a way that I hope doesn't fetishize her too much, I, um, I have been teaching um, and, and my students have really liked um, bringing in struggles of indigenous women who are fighting back against um, corporate transnational mining interests. And um, so, um, oh my gosh, 
I'm having a moment where I'm forgetting her name, even though I've talked her work many times. Um, there's just a lot of work around the, um, the conga mine and the way people have been pushing back against the conga mine, which is going to destroy um, a watershed system in Northern Peru. Um, and, um, and so understanding, I mean, it's as if, <laughs> This, this is where that, that, that challenge that Linda Tui Weissmith poses, uh, you really see how challenging it is. So here is um, a woman in a little house who is saying like, I'm not gonna sell my land to the mind because the mind is gonna destroy our lives. And this little, this person and her little house is the only thing stopping a multi-million, billion, gazillion dollar project that's gonna bring jobs and prosperity, you know, all the rhetoric. Um, and so um, what would it take for us to understand why what she's saying is true? You know, why what she's saying is true and that the costs will outweigh the benefits even for us to be able to, to think in that way. And I don't mean like a kind of, like an overly rational calculus, but just any calculus at all where we can understand that, that um, um, she, she actually understands better what is important. So, and I think there are many examples of, of people like that. And a lot of them are women. I mean, Berta Cáceres in Honduras is an example. So, so creating all those links um, and, you know, being able to survive where you, on the land that you live on, that's huge. <laughs> so that would be one, one way to answer your question. Yeah. Raul, I think you want to say one last thing and then I think we yes, have to... I, I thought uh, Estela was referring to Maxima Acuña, perhaps? Yes, I'm thinking of Maxima Acuña. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. And there are a lot of movies about her. That she, she's maybe becoming a little bit too iconographic, but she's such a powerful person and, and her voice is really powerful. Um, sometimes she sings, she sings her story. Um, so from a literary perspective, it's also really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, that's great. I was even just thinking to myself when you said, you know, why should we believe, uh, or why, what are kind of, what are the stakes of just one woman with a small house and why should we feel that, you know, the, the, talking about the costs and the benefits, really what it comes down to is just a narrative in a sense, like what is her narrative? What is the story and how are we interpreting that? So it's a nice parallel between something like that, dealing with the environment and um, then learning that this um, Maxima Cunha mm -hmm. sometimes sings her stories as a different type of narrative is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna stop the share, sorry. Um, so thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's really, it's really interesting for me. Thank you so much. Um, and I think um, Maxima Cunha and all the other authors that you mentioned really do um, write healing stories. So we, yeah, just for the sake of that, we have to read them all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's really so many, so many things that I think were very, very interesting also in relation to our context and our, you know, spatial surrounding and where do we find ourselves during the lockdown? Do we have internet access? Do we not? Um, what is our, you know, what, what is this format even? Are we in an ephemeral space or not? What are we doing with Zoom, et cetera? So, I'm always so grateful that you all participate in this and find ways to um, make this, yeah, to use this as a creative space to exchange our views on this. And I'm, um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward also to the next session that I will just quickly announce. And then we 
it will be actually um, Antonio Pelli's colleague from Brazil, um, Betania Assi. She will be talking about um, the, the decolonization of thought um, and her Indian perspective is a multinational naturalism and shamanic cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism <laughs> so many isms sorry um and she will be talking about Viveiros de Castro so um that will be in two weeks in on April 20th I will be very happy to see you all there and if not I mean you know this is a hybrid group um people come and go according to their interests but um, we do, I do think there's like a very, there's an ongoing narrative in this where we, we're onto something with this group. We'll see what happens. And thank you so, so, so much, um, Estelle. This was really, truly amazing and exactly what I wanted to happen in this group. Thank so you. thanks a lot. Thank you, Katarina and, and everybody for the conversation. And yeah, really glad I could be here. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon or evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye. Bye.